Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the afternoon session of the theme-based research scheme public symposium. In this session, we are very honored to have Professor Wai Yi Chen as the facilitator. Professor Chen is Professor of Biomedical Sciences, Director of School of Biomedical Sciences, and Deputy Chairman of Research Committee at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Chen is also an expert in developmental functional genomics and epigenomics of germ cells, germinal stem cell biology, and non-coding RNAs in normal and abnormal developments. Professor Chen, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, and that is Professor Catherine Chia. And I think uh, Professor Chia doesn't need any introduction, actually. I think everybody knows her. Uh, she's needing a T TBS, uh, and we participate in institutions including CDU of uh, Hong Kong, University of Texas in Dallas, and Tsinghua University. And Professor Chia is going to tell us about functional analysis of how genomic variation affects personal risk for degenerative skeletal disorders. Thank you, Wai. Um, I'd like to start off with this slide um, because uh, we all know from actually all the morning's talks that one of the most uh, uh, prevalent and, and uh, di diseases of focus in, in the world is cardiovascular disease and cancer. But however, both of those diseases tend to kill you. Um, some of, sometimes you die from that early. However, there are a whole slew of different types of disorder that affect us as we age and affect our quality of life. And it was very interesting that in 2013, in the Lancet, in a survey of the, of the global burden of diseases, uh, it was found that the disorder that was ranked number one was low back pain. And this was much worse than many of the other disorders that afflict us as we, as we grow older. And indeed, low back pain has, uh, is extremely common. And I'm sure maybe some of you in the audience have had episodes of back pain at some stage in your life. And it's probably almost certain by the time you reach 80 years old, you will definitely have experienced back pain. Um, but if it happens in the workforce or in younger people, this can actually have an immense uh, impact not only on uh, your own quality of life, but also on the economy. And so this is some figures that have been produced for Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong alone, every year we pay about 137 uh, million in compensation to days lost work, uh, uh, work days lost. So. Several years ago now, we started to tackle this grand challenge. And the grand challenge is, is the following. This degeneration, which is uh, in our back, in our spines, we see that we have a normal disc. This is a normal disc. You have these white structures here, which in an MRI reflects the intervertebral discs in our body. And in the normal state, these are nice and plump and white looking, very nice. And they actually serve to support spine and to cushion uh, the spine against impact as we are walking or whatever we're doing in our daily lives or in sports. However, as we grow older, we find that these discs begin to degenerate and that's seen in an MRI as a black disc, as sometimes described. And so this is an extremely common and complex disorder for which there are many different uh, uh, reasons, uh, contributing factors. Um, amongst them is inflammation and diet and weight and lifestyle, but very importantly, it was discovered some years ago now that genetics actually plays an important role uh, in modifying the severity and the onset of intervertebral disc degeneration, uh, which is also intimately linked with back pain, and my colleague will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But we set out um, in, at the beginning of this TRS program to ask the question, are we able in the long term to see whether we could come up with ways that we might be able to modify the onset severity and progression of degenerative intervertebral disc disease? 
But in order to do that, we need to understand more about what are the genetic factors and, uh, that affect this degeneration and what is the biology. And we started off by building on a foundation because uh, in, in 2004, we were fortunate to have an area of excellence program which enabled us to lay the, fine, the, lay the foundation stones for the TRS program. And, and in that program, we implicated a number of important uh, pathways in normal bi uh, biology, which actually, as it turns out, has a lot of implications to our current study. Amongst which was we established a cohort of individuals for which we had information about their, uh, their, their spines and, and uh, started to have a survey of their risk factors and identified an uh, important pathway uh, that was implicated in a dwarfism uh, 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 disorder uh, and also discovered something about the biology, about the normal biology and development of how bone cells form. And that led us to have the TRS program, which started in 2013, uh, where we aimed to take the following approach, where we would want to integrate multiple approaches of genetic systems biology and clinical data uh, to see whether we could come up with some ideas for future uh, treatment and therapeutic options. So our vision is, in the very long term, and I don't claim that we can have achieved this vision within the lifetime of this five years, is that at the end of the day, what motivates us is our ambition to be able to contribute to overcoming disability caused by intervertebral disc degeneration. And in order to do that, we have to understand the function of the disc, why it degenerates, and the relative propensity for developing disc degeneration. So to do that, we wanted to discover genetic factors that contribute to this generation. How does the disc work? And at the end, lay the foundation. Before we go on to look a little bit more about the degeneration itself, I'd like to explain something about what was our underlying uh, hypothesis that uh, led us to think about uh, this program. It's well known that when we are born in our intervertebral disc, you find in the disc, in a newborn and a young person, that in the nucleus pulposus, there are many cells there that look like the embryonic notochord cells. This is, a, this is a cell that is present in the very earliest time of development, and we still have remnants of these cells in our, our newborn disc. But it's observed that as you grow older, and by the time you're an adult, that these cells decline in number, but instead you see cells that look like, uh, that begin to look different, and they begin to look like chondrocytes. And by the time the, cell, the disc is degenerated, you see that there are cells that look like fibroblasts and look very different, and there are fewer cells. So the question we were asking is, normally, is this a normal situation, that this is the inevitable fate of this notochordal cell? that it should become like a fibroblastic-like cell? Or is it the outcome of all the stresses and impact of life? And if, if it is, then is there anything that we can do to stop this or retard this happening? And so the research approaches that we've taken in the program is obviously fundamentally we need to understand the biology of the disc. We need to understand what factors are important for the differentiation of the cells in the disc. And working towards therapy, we would like to see whether we could devise methods of actually generating these uh, cells in culture. But you know, one of the major advantages we had is that since we started the study a long time ago, by collecting people and MRIing them, we were in a unique position in the world to be able to carry out a longitudinal study of following their disc degeneration over 10 years. And so we can then try to link this longitudinal study with this, uh, risk factors and to understand the progression of this degeneration. Uh, this is a very busy slide and I, I think probably I shouldn't spend too much time, but it's just to give you the idea of how we try to integrate everything from understanding gene regulation and genes that are expressed in the biology of the disc and integrating information from the genome and proteins that are expressed, 
And by using mouse models as a surrogate to help us to understand the biology of the human disc, because we, it is difficult for us to study development of the human disc, uh, we will integrate all of that. Our aim was to integrate all of that to gain insights into what might be the etiology of this degeneration. We are a multidisciplinary team. There are many people with different expertise, the clinicians, uh, the clinical team, Ken Cheong and Dino and Keith Luke and Jason, are important for actually defining the phenotypes that are associated with this degeneration. We have the functional genomics and proteomics group where we try to study the biology, but very importantly, since we take a systems biology and a genetic approach, we have the in contribution of Pak Sham and Michael Chan our bioinformatics and statistical genetics. And moving towards uh, translation, we um, have uh, collaborated with the biomedical engineers like Barbara Chen and Sam Stoop. And we are supported by many international collaborators all over the world. So I'd like to move on to the next part, which tries to explain to you from actually the person who is the expert in the phenotypes that are associated with this degeneration, Dr. Dino Samatis. Thank you, Kathy, very much. So we, in individuals or patients that actually have disc degeneration and low back pain, uh, conservative treatment is an option. And this uh, usually entails medication, physical therapy, or injections. However, oftentimes this type of uh, therapy fails. So an alternative option is actually surgical intervention. However, surgery is actually not without complications. And in fact, surgery can be quite invasive and at times what it entails is actually removal of the intervertebral disc and application of rods and screws and things like that that can actually lead to reoperation in the future and can translate into increased uh, days in the hospital, hospital stay, and increased healthcare costs. Therefore, a key objective is in fact preventing disc degeneration and low back pain. And with that in mind, and as Kathy has mentioned, we've actually amassed the world's largest uh, population cohort focusing on uh, spine degeneration and pain. And to date, we've recruited over three and a half thousand individuals of southern Chinese origin, which we've evaluated at baseline, at five-year follow-up, and then at 10-year longitudinal follow-up, of which we've assessed their spinal phenotypes or spine changes on imaging and utilizing MRI. We've accounted for pain and disability profiling of these individuals, as well as looking into genetics, as well as into lifestyle and environmental risk factors to better understand who may develop this degeneration and pain. So how do we go about doing the spinal phenotyping? Well, we've adopted uh, the use of uh, MRI and we've, been, we've MRI'd everybody for over the past decade. Uh, MRI is a fantastic imaging modality because it allows you to, to properly assess the soft tissue structures in the human body in particularly pick up water content. And water content on MRI uh, is, is noted as a high signal intensity. So to illustrate this point, um, please look at the image on the left-hand corner. This is an MRI taken of an individual side profile. And here we can beautifully see all five discs of the lumbar spine region. And they are very well hydrated. They're plump. They have good disc space height. However, and as Kathy mentioned, with the aging process and altered biomechanics and genetics, the disc can change, it can dehydrate, the biochemical constitution can change, and this can lead into a black disc, oftentimes with disc herniations that we're all familiar with. Now, throughout this uh, duration of our project, we've also uh, adopted standardized classification schemes to assess uh, the disc's integrity, essentially looking at intensity of the disc. So if the disc is very bright or gray or black. But what we've come to understand throughout this course is that a black disc on MRI doesn't usually equate to actual disc degeneration that we see at a microscopic uh, tissue level. Therefore, we actually need to go beyond the typical black disc and disc herniations that we're all accustomed to and focus our attention on other spinal phenotypes such as high intensity zones, end plate abnormalities, and vertebral bone marrow changes, otherwise known as modic changes. So for example, high intensity zones are HIZs. What are they? Well, if you look at the MRI on the right-hand side, the arrows here point at this very high-intensity region that's at the periphery of the disc. And in fact, what is this? Well, essentially, HIZs occur because there's a rip or a fissure in the annulus fibrosis part of the disc, 
and there's an accumulation of disc breakdown material that can in fact be toxic to nerve fibers and nerve endings. However, up until now, uh, investigators worldwide have thought that HIZs are actually benign. They're not clinically relevant, so why even bother looking at them? Well, we've actually mapped these HIZs a little bit better. We've done some extensive uh, profiling of them, looking at their different morphology and their topography. We developed our own classification scheme, and we in fact noted that there are specific patterns of HIZs that are more associated with disc degeneration and other MRI phenotypes, but more importantly, some of these patterns aggregate in a way that can shed light in terms of who may develop low back pain and disability. Moving on, end plate abnormalities. Another interesting phenotype, we touched upon this in the last symposium, and essentially what we've noted is that if you have some type of end plate structural damage, this is associated with disc degeneration. However, we've done some intense phenotype profiling of these individuals, we've, done, uh, some class we've reported some classification schemes, and in a nutshell, what we've noted is that we essentially have two unique types or variants of end plate abnormalities, and these can either be typical or atypical variants, but it's the atypical ones that are associated with more severe forms of disc degeneration, and with that, potentially pain. Modic changes, potentially the most clinically relevant phenotype in our cohort and others. There are three types of modic changes. Type one is characterized as being uh, inflammatory in nature. Type two, fatty degeneration type three, sclerosis, and the most common type in our population and in others is type two. However, we've done some extensive MRI profiling of these modic changes, looking at their extent of vertebral body involvement and their location within the spinal segment. And again, we've noted that there's patterns of these modic changes that are more associated with disc degeneration and other MRI phenotypes. And more importantly, that are, there are unique variants of these modic changes and, and where they occur that are actually very telling in terms of who may develop low back pain and uh, disability. And they are indeed a very important imaging biomarker for pain. With regards to our follow-up longitudinal uh, project, we've seen that when we follow individuals for five years, yes, indeed, uh, the, the prevalence or the incidence of disc degeneration does increase, and in this case, 43% in this population. When we've assessed them, though, a 10-year follow-up, again, we see an increased rate of disc degeneration in the population, stressing the point that disc degeneration is a common phenomenon that occurs in the population. Disc herniations also increase. HIZs continue to be present. However, end plate abnormalities, we did not find them to be age-related. They seem to be more developmentally predisposed. However, modic changes seem to increase six-fold, and in fact, depending on the severity of disc herniation at baseline, this can actually predict the development of modic changes in the future. Now, with regards to lifestyle or environmental risk factors, the single factor that actually seems to be intertwined with disc degeneration and all these other uh, unique phenotypes is overweight or obesity or elevated BMI. So irrespective if you're a kid or if you're an adult, if you are overweight and obese, this may increase the risk of actually having disc degeneration and potentially pain later on. So with that said, I would like to uh, turn the, the platform over to Professor Pak Sham, who will address genetic risk factors and cross disorder associations in our project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dino. So lumbar disc degeneration has been known to have a high heritab heritable component from twin and family studies. And the aim of our T TRS our genetic program is to find specific genes that predispose to disc degeneration. And with these genes, we hope to have further um, innovative insights about the pathogenesis of the condition. So our genetic studies is based on the cohort that Kathy and Dino have already described with three, over 3,500 community subjects with the MRI measurements. And previously, we have investigated this cohort using family linkage and candidate gene approaches. And with, within this TRS, we have shifted to a more comprehensive and powerful genome-wide approaches, including genome-wide association study on a subset of 2,300 subjects using SNP arrays and whole exome sequencing on a smaller subset of 715 people. And 
the genome-wide association study focus on common variants, um, but it are unable to cover rare variants. And so the whole exome sequencing study, looking at rare variants in coding sequences, is complementary. So these are the list of genes that we previously detected prior to our genome-wide approaches. So these were detected using linkage and candidate gene approaches. And all these genes are involved in the function of the extracellular matrix in skeletal tissues. So they include proteins that, are structural, that have structural function and others that are enzymes and others that are important receptors and signaling molecules. But they are not so unexpected because they are based on uh, candidate gene approaches. And with genome-wide approaches, we hope to find genes that are more novel. So with, for complex traits, genetics, the definition of the phenotype is really important. And there is a potential for heterogeneity among the, the, the patients in terms of the, the, this degeneration. And, because of, and in addition, our phenotype is really complex. There are many MRI changes that Dino already described, and there are five lumbar disc levels. So what we did was to conduct a very comprehensive multivariate statistical analysis of these phenotypes of these um, changes, looking at their correlations among each other and also with age and BMI. And as a result, we uncovered two different subtypes of changes. The first is associated with increasing age and increasing BMI, and these constitute the lower level changes. And and these are likely to be degenerative in origin. And the other subtype are less correlated with age or BMI, and they constitute the end plate changes and the upper level changes, and we consider these to be more likely to be developmental in origin. And as a result, we constructed two different scores, one for de degenerative changes and the other uh, developmental. So in a GWAS, we correlate the phenotype with all the nearly one million single nucleotide polymorphisms that we measure on the array. And the results, the p-values, are displayed with these different plots. So in this plot, looking at the phenotype of DDD scoring and disc bulging, we see a deviation of the p-values observe p-values from the expected 45 degree line, and this suggests that there are true association signals. And the Manhattan plot here shows that we have one result which reaches the genome-wide level of significance, and zooming in, we see that this region contains the SEG3 gene, which interestingly has been associated with obesity, which Dino has already indicated is one of the main risk factors for this degeneration. And interestingly, when we looked at the whole exome sequencing data, we find that the SEG3 gene also harbor an excess of rare variants in individuals with this degeneration compared to individuals with relatively normal disc. And this was statistically significant and statistically significant even after conditioning on the common variants in this region. You know, my association study can not only be used to test single variants or single genes, but can also be used to test an entire biological pathway to see if the pathway have genes that have, uh, that contain SNPs with a, a sort of unusually small p-values. 
And when we looked at use this pathway-based approach on the developmental scores, this was largely negative. There was no pathway which worked significant. But for the degenerative score, the beta-3 integrin pathway was significant. And this is reflected in the small p-values of a number of genes in this pathway. Of course, the integrins are important in the function of, of extracellular matrix through um, its important role in the inter interaction between the cell and the extracellular matrix, and it also acts as um, important signaling molecules. And when we use this pathway-based approach on the, uh, the whole exon sequencing data, again, the developmental score didn't provide us with any significant results, but again, the degenerative score came up with a number of interesting pathways which are involved in the cellular response to stress, inflammation, and in particular, the notch, which is important in inflammation and sustained activation of notch signaling has been associated with, with cartilage degradation. So in summary, the main genetic findings from our program are firstly improve phenotypic definition with um, the, the two scores, the degenerative and developmental scores, a genome-wide significant signal as in the region of SCG3, and interesting set-based association re results implicating integrins, uh, cellular response to stress, inflammation, and the notch pathway. So at this stage, I'd like to invite Professor Danny Chan to talk about our work on uh, on the molecular mechanism using mouse models and integration with human data. So thank you, Pak. So following the uh, human genetics studies, it's an important question for us to uh, ask is whether we can further harness the data we have to find additional uh, genetic risk factors and to understand the function of these uh, genetic factors uh, in the degenerative process. So for this, we look for uh, in vivo mouse models, and today I would like to use two examples of mouse with individual degeneration and implication of potential modifiers and protective genes and their correlation to uh, the human finding that we have. The first example is the good healer and the bad, bad healer mice where they have different capacity to, re to heal damaged uh, tissues uh, due to their genetic differences. As for example, the good healer mice can heal a punch uh, readily uh, within a couple of weeks, whereas the poor healer mice is not able to do that. And these change differences is reflected to the, the ability to maintain uh, integrity of the uh, individual discs. Uh, you can see from the good healer, the LG uh, J mice can maintain a good healthy disc with relatively homogeneous pool of uh, notochordal like cells uh, in early life, whereas in the poor healer uh, they are not able to do so. We can observe early onset degenerative processes. And these processes uh, is characterized by the presence of uh, chondrocyte-like cells uh, here, as well as cell clusters surrounded by a large amount of extracellular matrix. And this is consistent with uh, enhanced chondrogenic and actually fibrotic uh, uh, events that we see in the human conditions. So therefore, uh, what we see here, in addition to also the cellular and molecular analysis, we found that we can see an accelerated change in, in the individual disc uh, in a, through an enhanced the chondrogenic uh, events. So here we have a natural mouse model uh, with spontaneous degeneration of the individual disc. So uh, an advantage of using mouse model uh, is that we can perform genetic mapping analysis. So by crossing the two parental mice, the, L the LGJ and SMJ, we can look at the offsprings and look at their changes in the disc and map the, uh, and filter out, and look at the invertible disc changes as a uh, genetic trait, we can actually filter out the so-called bad genes. And from this, uh, these so-called bad genes or, uh, or risk factors, uh, we map this to the uh, biological pathways. Uh, interestingly, most of these pathways force into the uh, ion transport uh, pathways, which is uh, important for uh, cellular functions. And furthermore, we took the four, uh, top 14 genes and selected uh, genetic variations from the equivalent human uh, 
uh, genes and perform an association study that show this uh, indication of association with individual degeneration. And the presence of the VDR gene, which is a known genetic risk factor uh, in the human cohort, uh, supports the uh, fact that maybe this is a new set of genes and, uh, and, 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 and biological pathway that we can follow up in the future. So the second example that I'd like to uh, put forward is uh, the transect mouse model that we made overexpressing a human genetic risk factor, uh, which is the asporin gene that we identified in our cohort. Uh, now, the asporin gene is a uh, extracellular matrix known to regulate TGF beta signaling. So we made this both in the C57 background and also the LGJ good healer background. The C57 is considered to be a, a poor healer. Uh, we express the transgene using a promoter that uh, drives the expression in the individual disc. Uh, you can see here uh, from the reported like that gene, the uh, blue cells are within the uh, individual disc. The exciting finding is that what we see, what we see uh, in the individual disc is that the changes are, are very similar to the LGJ months. So in this case here, we have early onset individual degeneration. Uh, the presence of chondrocyte light cells, cell clusters that are surrounded by lots of extracellular matrix, in addition, uh, we associated this with enhanced TGF beta singling. So, uh, in, the, in the context of what the changes uh, within the individual disc is very similar to the LGJ uh, Puhela mice, where the, the, uh, the, where the risk factor as foreign is pushing a, uh, a, an enhanced chondrogenic event uh, within the individual disc. So finally, what we wanted to understand is that um, the genetic uh, risks that are imposed by the presence of asporin, can we modify this? So for this, we bred the, uh, the asporin uh, C57 mouse into the good healer background and asked what, what, are, what are the changes within the disc. So while we can show that uh, there are aging differences between the C57 and the LGJ mice, uh, that, are, that are a little bit different, uh, but at the same time, uh, the presence of the sporin gene induces an a, a early onset degenerative process. However, in the LGTA background, uh, this can be protected. Okay. And so therefore, I think uh, what we're showing here is that while a human genetic risk factor imposes an enhanced contragenic event in a mouse disease, this can be uh, um, uh, mod modified uh, uh, by projective factors. And finally, put this in the context of this degenerative flow, flow chart that uh, can be put forward before, uh, what we can say is that while there are genetic factors that enhances these sort of cellular uh, changes leading to the con uh, degenerative condition, uh, these changes can be, ch these outcomes can be changed if we can identify the uh, protective factors, and this is a new area in which we can uh, look forward to, uh, for further research. And with this, I give the podium back to Kathy to finish off. So I hope you have a taste uh, of seeing the power of genetics and phenotyping in trying to help us to uh, understand more about um, this degeneration. But however, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is really important if we're going to move forwards to think about how we might go to prevent um, uh, this degeneration or alleviate the, 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 the problem, is really we need to understand what might be potential cells that maintain the dis and, and the mechanisms and the pathways. So I'd like to share with you, moving on from, uh, from this diagram here, which shows that you have this uh, change in phenotype of cells as the disc degenerates. So we would like to ask the question, is this not a caudal like cell, then a stem cell? Is this the kind of cell that keeps the disc in its healthy state? And in order to do that, this is kind of difficult to, to be able to, to dissect this in the humans. So we wanted to see whether we could use the mouse as a model for the biology at any rate for some uh, uh, to indicate uh, uh, um, uh, the presence of stem cells in the, in, in the intervertebral disc. And we made use of the fact that we also have a mouse, another mouse, that degenerates its disc uh, ex extremely uh, prematurely. And it especially degenerates its disc at a state in this part of its tail. And while you might say the mouse is not like the human, 
we discovered that actually since mice stand on its tail here, it's this region in the case of a, of a genetic mutant that actually degenerates even faster. So this implies that stress or mechanical stress or loading, which is similar perhaps to what you might think might happen in obesity and overweight, um, could be contributing to this degeneration. So the first thing is we wanted to know, as I showed you in that diagram, that there are many, that the, the nucleus pulposus has actually got many different types of appearing cells in there. And so it is not very helpful if you just isolate all the cells and then just look at the genes that are expressed in all the cells, because what you get is an average. So it would be very important if we could actually probe the single cells from a human disc and find out what were they. Were they a notochordal cell? Were they a chondrocyte-like cell? Were they a fibroblast? And so in order to do that, we took two approaches. First, obviously, we would like to isolate single cells from the human disc, a healthy and a degenerative disc. But we also need to find a way of identifying what those cells are. And so we took the, uh, the strategy of seeing, first of all, what is the signature of a notochordal cell using the mouse as a surrogate. And we very interestingly found that we could actually get some a correlation in molecular signatures, not 100% because the mouse is not a human, but that seemed to be a, a, a marker that we could actually find that could indicate that you actually had a embryonic or notochordal-like cell in the, human, uh, in the human NP. And we further used the mouse to see whether we could identify a stem cell-like population there by seeing whether we have cells that are sort of very slow cycling and they are a characteristic of a stem cell that would be as being slow cycling, they would be sort of like in storage and be activated when required uh, to produce more healthy cells. And indeed, using the mouse as a model and a way of tracking these slow cycling cells, we did identify them. And we identified them and they were very similar to the embryonic notochordal-like cell. And so to cut, uh, because it is actually quite complicated, we sequenced more than 2,000 of these uh, human uh, nucle uh, nucleus pulposus cells from degenerated and non-degenerated, and identified a few genes, in particular one, that seemed to increase in its frequency in, in expression in cells in the degenerated disc, and that the proportions of that embryonic-like uh, 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 marker for the uh, notochordal cells declined uh, with age, which is an indication that these cells are being exhausted and disappearing with age. And so it seems like in the embryonic stage, as you go through life, you get more and you get fewer and fewer of them, and in the end, you get a degenerated disc with uh, different types of uh, with the degenerated cells. Um, I'm running out of time, but I just want to share with you one last um, very exciting uh, 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 analysis that we did from analyzing these cells and seeing what are the major pathways that are implicated. We identified one pathway, which is the integrated stress response, as being implicated in this degeneration. And this stress response actually is, lies at the center of many stresses that a cell in the intervertebral disc will experience in life. Mechanical stress from loading, hypoxic stress because the cells are under hypo hypoxia, uh, in the case of uh, inflammation, uh, and in the case of oxidative stress. And all of this, at the center of this, is the integrated stress response. And what we found in, by going back to the genetic studies and looking at our mouse model, that we indeed found enrichment for members of this pathway in this degeneration. And even more excitingly, by treating mice with a small molecule that can alleviate or prevent the integrated stress response, we are able to rescue uh, the this degeneration using this mouse model. Um, and indeed, as you can see, uh, when we have aberrant uh, nucleus pulposus differentiation in early onset disc degeneration, treating these mice with a small molecule removes that aberrant uh, 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 differentiation and relieves the disc degeneration. So at the end of the day, we, we, we are hypothesizing that maybe an approach to inhibit or alleviate uh, this degeneration effects early on might be to inhibit the integrated stress response using the small molecule ISRIB. 
So to summarize, uh, in our TRS program, we have through longitudinal studies, human genetics and systems biology, by understanding the molecular signatures of intervertebral disc cells and I, I identifying stem cells there, and I didn't have time to tell about how we differentiate them in, vi in vitro, um, we have actually, by integrating our understanding of the phenotypes and the pathways that might be implicated in this degeneration, uh, come up with a mechanism for how uh, the stress response can lead to a skeletal disorder and ended up with a therapeutic lead. And so the long-term impact of our program is that we hope that in the future, through our studies, we will contribute to helping people maintain a high quality of life instead of having your disc degenerate fast, maybe slower, and that we can all keep on moving and dancing. Thank you very much. Sorry to be a little bit over in time. Thank you, Professor Cheer and her team. Please remain on stage. We will now invite Professor Yi Chen to come forward to host the Q&A section. Okay, so I'll stand too. So thank you, Kennedy, for presenting a very interesting talk. So I think the talk is open to the floor. Any question? <coughs> so uh, as you mentioned, uh, mechanical uh, loading, the body weight support is an important factor for the, this type of disease. But I, you know, for mice, which is a tetrapedal, do you think that it would be good model to study this question? Yeah, this is, a, this is a question we get all the time. Is the mouse a good model for this degeneration? And I, this is a well taken point. Um, but um, I actually didn't have time to explain about that mouse that was standing on its tail. So we were actually quite gratified to find that by looking at mice, we realize although they, they walk on four, on four legs, they do stand on their tail. And we found that especially in this mouse mutant where the integrated stress response was activated uh, abnormally, that actually the disc degenerated faster in that, particularly in that region where they were standing on their tail. And uh, for old mice, if you look, it's that part of the tail that degenerates. So, of course, it's not the same as a human disc, but we are trying to say that maybe we can, if we understand the molecular events, we make use of these molecular events to then go and test it out in the human situation from the genetics. Yeah. If I actually add to that a little bit more, I think this is an important question that many will get asked a lot. But if you look at the physics and the loading of the disc, in fact, a, 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 a quadruped keeping a spine in a horizontal condition uh, environment, it, it needs a lot of strength for the muscle to keep that, that horizontal. So if you actually talk to the vets, they say, in fact, keeping the disc, the loading on the disc is higher than the bipedal because it needs that muscle loading to keep it in horizontal space. So since there's no question on the floor, maybe, maybe I'll ask a question. Yeah. Now, you, take, you do single cell analysis, right? So do you take the cells from the same stage because in the degeneration, there are several stages. So unfortunately, in humans, we, we don't have a choice. So it depends what patient appears. And so what we've done is to, when we have a patient that's having surgery because of a degenerated disc, then we will pick, we will take the nucleus pulposus mm -hmm. and randomly pick cells. Um, and then if we have a person without a degenerated disc, and usually these are people that are not absolutely normal, they have scoliosis, but they mm. don't, on an MRI, they're not degenerated the disc. So again, we pick randomly. So it's random picking of cells. We don't actually, because they're not marked by anything, we, pick, we just pick cells. Um, and we don't also have a choice of whether they're age matched or not. Um, uh, and so, so this is the difficulty. And so we're trying to interpret by looking at the signatures of each individual cell and by using comparisons with, say, other systems like um, the mouse. But we also have a cell line from a, 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 a human tumor which resembles a notochordal-like cell. Mm -hmm. and we're using that also to try to guide us to see whether we can identify what cell type is it that we're seeing when we look at their signature. So it's a sort of like uh, iterative back and forth, trying to figure out what the cell is. 
But of course, we know what a chondrocyte looks like. Actually, we know a lot about chondrocytes, more than we know about the notochordal cell. And so we can actually identify that there are chondrocyte-like cells there too. So it's a mixture of knowledge, uh, existing knowledge, and detective work, really. Yeah. Okay. Now, another question is that uh, because the cells pathway being involved, do you think it might, it might in fact, respond to whatever factor present in the environment, in the leech, where the cells are? Yes, I'm sure. Uh, and that's why it's very interesting that um, when PAC had done the pathway analysis, they found TGF beta. This pathway was uh, right. very significant. Asporin, which Danny described, that is a mouse where Asporin's proposed role is actually to facilitate TGF beta signaling. So you have more Asporin, you can actually uh, elevate signaling. And if you elevate TGF beta signaling, you will stimulate the synthesis of many extracellular matrix genes which are like fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine if you activate TGF beta in the dis, uh, then you will lead to fibrosis. And, and so, so, so this is probably one you know, mechanism that's uh, underlying. So right, because I, I heard that, you know, uh, if uh, I don't hear wrong, is that you, you do see a lot of inflammatory genes involved. So can it be, sub I mean, consequential instead of causative? Both. So I, th so I think if you take the example of the sporin gene itself, a sporin is a risk factor. But what we've done in the mouse is we sort of overexpress it so that it itself can induce it. But you can see from the uh, human degenerative process, the sporin is actually increasing in expression during degeneration itself. So it could be both an induction as well as the uh, uh, enhancement of the progression. Of the, uh, of the genetic processes well too. What we also found for the Asporin um, uh, mouse is that it actually changes the extracellular matrix. It changes the extracellular matrix components that regulates TGF beta singly, for example, fibrillin. So this is really a change in the extracellular matrix component niche of the cells that is driving that uh, change. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can pass the mic uh, over yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I would say it's a beautiful set of studies, um, to start from the human genetics uh, to the mouse studies. And the human genetics studies, therefore, I, I ask uh, Peck, uh, and then perhaps uh, you, you can follow the, by, by the mouse uh, persons too. Uh, the, in the human genetics study, you're looking for common variants because of your design, right? So Mostly, it's not, yes. I mean, do you find a really common variants, specific variants that is a that's associated with a, the phenotype that Dino defined. <laughs> I mean, the most significant common variant is in the SCG3 gene. In the particular um, variant? I mean, yeah, th th that was okay. a common variant. Okay. But with the pathway analysis, you know, for the pathway as a whole, there is a signal in sort of the, this, the the SNPs within the genes in the yeah. pathway have smaller p-values yeah, than I you'd understand. expect. But unfortunately, the, you know, in terms of the numbers, it's not enough to, to really pinpoint sort of a, a specific subset of the variants. Right. So, you know, if we can only say, well, this pathway, you know, the genes in that pathway have um, smaller, significantly smaller p-values than expected. So, so you, I mean, can you uh, actually test it out biochemically, right? Yes, the, yes. The I mean, biochemists the, on yeah. the other side. So it okay. is, you know, sort of it throws up that pathway for further studies. Right. But, okay. you know, but okay. it unfortunately it doesn't throw up a single variant yeah, for further Yeah, I understand studies, the limitation yeah. of such studies. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah. from human to mice, yes. in mice, um, you guys are based on knockouts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No? no. No, it's not knockout. We're modeling the risk factor, so we're really overexpressing the risk, human risk gene itself. But then the, so, some of the earlier ones, are they knockouts? No? The mouse model that I presented are not knockouts. So the good hill and bad hill, these are natural uh, different mouse strains that uh, have spontaneous uh, degenerative okay. changes. The other mouse model is the overexpression of a human known risk factor, the Asporin gene, that also induces very similar changes as the 
Uh, it's an overexpression of that gene. That's right. In yes. in the, it's a human gene. That we're but I thought that some of the studies that Kathy presented were knockouts, no? No. Um, okay, so, sorry. So, oh, so that was That's a, done. Uh, we no, discovered that. that this dwarfism syndrome, where you have activated ER stress in the cells, actually also causes premature disdegeneration. Okay. Right. And that's led us to identify the mechanism. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about it and perhaps too specialized, but to cut it simply, activating the integrated stress response activates some transcription factors like SOX9, which is a powerful regulator of genes that encode the extracellular matrix. So if you activate SOX9 inappropriately, you are going to activate extracellular matrix changes that would be consistent with a change in the niche of the this, uh, which will cause fibrosis. But I didn't have this too scientific to, to talk in detail here. <laughs> but the exciting thing is that we found, because we found the mechanism, uh, we found a small molecule that interferes with the expression of this SOX9 and we can alleviate it and rescue the phenotype. So that's the exciting part. Yes, yes, it's a small molecule. ISRIB had previously been discovered by screening uh, that targets the preferential translation of uh, part of the ER stress pathway. Uh, and by doing that, it doesn't actually, it's no toxic effect on the mice, but it does seem to rescue both the chondrodysplasia and the dis degeneration. No, unfortunately, this molecule is a bit insoluble. So I think we need to go forwards and, you know, people need to do something more. Uh, chemists. <laughs> yeah. We may take one last question from the audience. Well, since no one has asked, uh, is there, now, because I understand there, there are actually several phenotypes of the vertebral uh, abnormalities. Is there any genotype phenotype correlation? When our multivariate analysis showed two clusters of phenotypes. So the, the phenotypes that we classified as degenerative are all highly correlated with each other, um, whereas the ones you know, the, the one that we classified as developmental, again, highly correlated. And I guess you know, the fact that we found significant association at the pathway level for the degenerative but not for the developmental, is a kind of a, a genotype-phenotype interaction. I mean, we, we envisage that the developmental changes are were there at an early age, and they don't progress. And the degenerative changes are what is progressive through age. But there are actually very specific phenotypes that correlate quite better than each other. So for example, for the identification of the HC3, uh, gene, the correlation is best that when there's a combination be, be, between the this changes, this is a disintensity change, hydration uh, together with disbulging. So these are two very highly correlated phenotypes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chi and her team. Thank you.